We're working safely with the skeleton crew from our home, the Craig H. Nielsen Auditorium in the Museum of Mississippi History and Mississippi Civil Rights Museum. Tune in next week when we'll be joined by author Mike Bunn as he delves into the early history of the state with 14th Colony, the Gulf South in the Revolutionary Era. Today, we are delighted to welcome Nancy K. Bristow to discuss her new book, Steeped in the Blood of Racism, Black Power, Law and Order, and the 1970 shootings at Jackson State College. Nancy K. Bristow is Distinguished Professor of History at the University of Puget Sound, where she serves on the leadership team of the Race and Pedagogy Institute and helped found the African American Studies Program. An award-winning teacher, Bristow is the author of three books, including American Pandemic, Lost Worlds of the 1918 Influenza Epidemic. Professor Bristow is joining us via Zoom from Washington State, and she'll say a few words to us. Then we'll play a video presentation she created for History's Lunch. At its conclusion, Bristow will return to respond to questions, which you can ask anytime in the comments section of this live stream. Now, here's Nancy Bristow. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodwin. It is uh, such an honor to be with all of you uh, in Mississippi today. Uh, in a moment, we'll start the video where, where you'll hear that I have a lot of people to thank. And I will say it again, that this is a project that wouldn't have been possible without the assistance, the support, uh, and the willingness to share their stories of so many from the Jackson State community. In addition to those that I thank in just a moment, I wanted to add a couple of more names. First, I wanna thank obviously Dr. Chris Goodwin for the invitation to be with all of you today. And I want to thank Mr. Jerome Porter and Mr. Eric Watkins for being our tech team and for making things seem simple when I know they're anything but. And I want to add the name of Dr. Doris Derby to those I thank from the Jackson State community. You'll see some of her photographs in this presentation and they also appear in my book. But again, it's just lovely, wonderful to be with you even as we turn to what is a terrible and difficult story. Um, so without further ado, let's watch the video. Thank you so much for the invitation to be a part of the History is Lunch series here at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. I owe a deep debt of gratitude to MDAH and to all of the archivists who helped me with my work over the years. So it's a real special honor to be here. In addition, I also wanna say thank you to many, many people who made this project possible. Um, in a better non-COVID world, some of these folks and I would be together doing a session at MDAH live but we live in a different world. So I at least want to say these people's names and thank them publicly for all the assistance they gave me. If I've forgotten you in my list, I apologize. But some of the people who were instrumental in getting this project through was Robert Braddy, Linda Braddy, Maddie Hull, Gloria McRae, James Lapp Baker, Dr. Robert Smith, Constance Slaughter Harvey, Vernon Steve Weekly, Leroy Kenter, Larry Breland, Darlita Ballard, Eddie Jean Carr, Lucius Edwards, Dr. Hilliard Lackey, Dr. Robert Luckett, C. Lee McGinnis, Dr. John Peoples, Dr. Ivory Phillips, Ed Swinney, Hillman Frazier, and Dr. Mamie Crockett. Without their voices, this project would have been impossible. And as always and as ever, I am so grateful to each of them for sharing their story with me. So, Without further ado, let us turn to the story of the shootings at Jackson State College in May 1970. I'm going to share my screen so that you can have some images to follow as I talk today. Okay. At 10 o'clock on May 14, 1970, James Earl Green, high school senior, left his job at the Wagga Bag Grocery in Jackson, Mississippi. The middle of nine children, James had held the job since the age of 11 and had frequently shared his earnings with the family. As he usually did, Green took a shortcut on his way home after work. It was late at night and he wanted to get home. So he took the shortcut through Jackson State College, which he usually did. JSC, of course, was a historically black institution located west of downtown Jackson. There'd been some unrest on the Jackson State campus the night before, but this was the quickest way home for Green. And so a little after midnight, early on the morning of May 15th, he was still on campus, standing across Lynch Street from Alexander Hall, a women's dormitory, watching an escalating situation. 
Stella Spinks had come to campus to borrow a book from a friend who lived in Alexander Hall. Noting a disturbance down Lynch Street, she'd stepped out of the dorm to see what was going on and had watched a dump truck burning in the middle of the street in front of Stewart Hall, west of her. A little later though, she realized that law enforcement was marching up the street toward her and made nervous by the approaching police forces, she went back inside the building and was watching the action on Lynch Street from window in the stairwell of the west wing of the dorm with 20 or so other women. Eddie Jean McDonald, the recently elected Miss Jackson State, was leaning out her window in Alexander Hall with her roommate, Mary Gibbs. They'd been talking to Mary's brother, Philip. McDonald heard something. It wasn't a gunshot, but more like a bottle breaking. And then she recalled it started. Instantaneously, she said, by the time that bottle hit, all hell, everything broke out. The Jackson police and the Mississippi Highway and Safety Patrol had opened fire on the students, spraying shots up and down the side of the dormitory and into the students gathered in front of the building. When the shooting stopped, two young people, James Earl Green and Philip Lafayette Gibbs lay dead and Stella Spinks and 11 other students bled from their gunshot wounds. Students quickly rushed to assist the wounded. Law enforcement offered no aid but instead continued to use the most derogatory language as they ordered the students to check on those who appeared critically injured. Only after the police and the highway patrol were replaced by National Guardsmen did students find assistance in caring for the wounded and the dead. That first night, hundreds of students remained in front of the dorm, expressing their outrage and grief at what happened and trying to find solace together. By morning, the college had suspended the remainder of the semester, and hundreds of students left for home. But hundreds of others remained, maintaining a vigil in front of the dorm. When workers from the highway patrol's crime lab arrived to remove the damaged walls and windows, students blocked their way and sought a restraining order against the state. As one student exclaimed when the first state workers arrived, don't you see what they're doing? They're taking these scars away. When a judge ruled against the students and in fact demanded the, that the evidence be removed, the students burned the decision and opened defiance. Finally, on May 23rd, eight days after the shootings, the students stepped aside, but only after the US Attorney, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights allowed them to observe the removal and promised the evidence would be handed directly to the FBI. In the aftermath of the horrific violence on their campus, the students had expressed their unwavering certainty that the state could not be trusted with the evidence. They feared that what had happened to them would be misrepresented, that justice would prove elusive, and they tried to protect the evidence and the memory of what had just happened to them. The students' concerns proved prescient. Though an examination of the evidence from the night demonstrates unequivocally that law enforcement's actions were unwarranted, indeed illegal, in the months and the years to come, the victims of this assault were unable to gain justice and their story faded from the nation's memory. Today then, I want to recount the events, countering that amnesia in an act of historical reclamation. And as I do so, I hope to accomplish three other things. First, I want to clarify just how egregious the actions of law enforcement were that night. Second, I want to explore how it was possible, given the clearly illegal behavior of the police, for justice to prove so elusive. And finally, I want to close with just a few words about why it's so important that we remember what happened 50 years ago to the students at Jackson State College. So let me back up a little bit. I want to set some context and tell you a little bit more, more detail about what happened that night. So Jackson State College was founded as Natchez Cemetery in 1877, one of those immediate post-Civil War efforts to raise up African Americans by way of education. By the mid-1960s, it was one of over 100 HBCUs in the United States. Now, students at Jackson State had a reputation for avoiding social issues during the early years of the civil rights struggle, but of course that makes quite a bit of sense when you look at this image of the Board of Trustees, which was all white. The college president was under orders to keep a lid on activism, and so the campus remained relatively quiet. Now, there were always students who were willing to challenge the status quo, but when they did so, they often paid for that activism with expulsion. But with the coming of a new president in 1967, 
Dr. John A. Peoples, the campus was changing. African-American studies was being cautiously added to the curriculum. Students had created an Afro-American society, the Institute for the Study of History, Life, and Culture of Black People, today's Margaret Walker Center, was founded with Margaret Walker at its head. And the blue and white flash, the student newspaper, increasingly ran stories that celebrated blackness, engaged political issues, and called on students to become more active. So in the spring of 1970, for instance, when National Guardsmen opened fire on students at Kent State University, students who were protesting the war in Vietnam and the incursion into Cambodia, students at Jackson State College actually joined other students around the country in deploring and protesting that violence. Now the campus in 1970, here's an image from above, um, was divided down the middle by Lynch Street. This is familiar to those of you who are in Jackson uh, and who realize now, of course, that that's been closed off and is now a pedestrian walkway. But in May 1970, it was still a major thoroughfare that carried white suburbanites between suburbs in the West and their jobs in downtown Jackson. Now, each spring, there had been unrest on, on Lynch Street, um, starting in 1964. Uh, and these confrontations often involved local Black youth, Black students from Jackson State, but white motorists and local police. And these disruptions usually centered on Lynch Street and were usually caused, in fact, by the constant mistreatment and disrespect that the students faced at the hands of the white motorists. And the spring of 1970 was no different. In fact, on the night of May 13th, rocks thrown at white commuters had brought police to the campus. Signaling the racial hostility that was at the center of the confrontation that first night, the police repeatedly and routinely used derogatory language, including, of course, the N-word. The closure of Lynch Street that night of the 13th, though, ended the problem with the white motorists, though the presence of the police certainly provoked the students further. And over the course of the evening, two trash barrels were burned, though in the midst of the spring of 1970, that would have been a very minor event. The college administration imposed a curfew, but National Guardsmen were brought proactively. But because law enforcement didn't enter the campus, the students eventually quieted and the evening ended without injury. There was an important lesson in that, a lesson, unfortunately, that law enforcement chose not to learn from. Well, with things quieted down during the night, President Peoples met with some students, and those students explained that they thought it was the draft, the invasion of Cambodia, the on-campus curfew, and the quality of campus food, in fact, that were motivating the unrest among the students. And they assured the president that they would work to keep quiet on the campus in the coming days. And on the morning of May 14th, true to their word, the campus was in fact calm. Now, still reeling from the disturbance, President Peoples communicated his disappointment with the students uh, in an announcement that included these words. He blamed the students for being a mindless mob, suggested they had been bent on doing violence, and crit criticized them, saying ultimately, that leadership must be made of sterner stuff than what you exhibited last night. In a second meeting, student leaders again reassured him that they would work to keep the calm. Around 9.30 on the night of May 14th though, some young people, students, local youths, it's not clear, again threw rocks at cars driven by white motorists near Stewart Hall. The reasons for the renewed trouble remain unclear despite all of my research. There are lots of possibilities. One is that there seemed to be a rumor related uh, to Charles Edward, <laughs> Charles Ever, suggesting that in fact he had been killed, he and his wife, and that students were upset about that. Others suggested that they were out protesting because they were really concerned about the war in Vietnam, the invasion of Cambodia, and they were trying to draw attention to those issues. But most likely, it seems, the source for the outbreak was once more the problems of Lynch Street and the continued sense of students that this was a site of humiliation and of danger for them. With the renewed rock throwing, Jackson State security forces closed off Lynch Street. It was at this point that a group of young people commandeered a dump truck and parked it at a nearby construction site and drove it up Lynch Street, Lynch Street where it stalled near Stewart Hall. Someone, most likely in this case a non-student, set the truck afire and this gave the city a reason to send police back to campus. 26 members of the Jackson Police Department and 40 members of the Mississippi Highway and Safety Patrol marched to campus. The fire was easily doused, 
and the fire truck that had been called retreated quickly. It was headed to another fire just west, or excuse me, just east of the campus, but rather than provoke the students, the firefighters chose to drive around the campus. But the highway patrol, Jackson police, inexplicably formed a phalanx and marched right through to the center of campus. And again, here's a map that shows you where Stewart Hall is. Rather than departing to the west, as the firefighters had done, they marched due east into the very heart of the campus. Again, for no apparent reason. They stopped in turn right in front of the west wing of Alexander Hall. They turned to face the dormitory with their guns drawn and shown their, the spotlight from Thompson's tank on the women's windows and on the students that were gathered in front of the dorm on the lawn. Law enforcement's presence certainly provoked the students who before that had really just been enjoying a warm Mississippi evening with friends. They knew they hadn't done anything wrong and they were provoked by what they saw as the invasion of their campus by a heavily armed force. Some in the crowd yelled at officers, some even used obscenities and sexually innuendo. But when they were ordered to move behind the fence in front of the dormitory, everyone cooperated. As Vernon Stephen Weekly explained, I'll never forget this as long as I live. No students were in the streets. They, meaning law enforcement, had that. They owned it. And then the glass bottle that Eddie G. McDonald heard struck the pavement and the officers opened fire. Bert Case from w WJTV thought they were shooting into the air or maybe shooting tear gas. But then he heard the shattering of glass and realized the officers were actually shooting into this building. He watched as they systematically shot into the windows from the top floor down to the bottom. Associated Press reporter James Hank Downey assumed they were using blanks. He couldn't believe that they would be shooting live ammunition at point blank range. President Peoples too thought they must be shooting tear gas or maybe blanks. And then by walkie talkie was told, doctor, they're shooting live bullets. National, Command, National Guard Commander General Walter Johnson was 115 meters west on Lynch Street talking with his second command when the shooting broke out. He took off at a run, the screams of the students filling his ears. Oh my God, he exclaimed as he surveyed the scene at Alexander Hall. They've done it all wrong. And indeed they had. The gunfire was so unexpected, so completely outrageous that many students assumed the shootings must have been planned. As James Lapp Baker explained, everybody's quiet. You don't even need to be on campus. What are you coming on there for? There's no disturbance. Your objective was to massacre some black students. Larry Breland couldn't help but wonder, is this a planned thing? Why was so much force used in the very beginning? Why would that kind of force be used? It was, he concluded, too carefully orchestrated to be unplanned. Well, planned or not, and I did not find evidence to suggest it was, the behavior of law enforcement that night was clearly criminal. So let me turn now to the failures on the part of law enforcement, the failures that were caused by their white supremacy. The racism was at the heart of this violence is easy to see. In 1970, only 19 of the 279 members of the Jackson Police Force were African-American. The, the Highway and Safety Patrol had yet to hire a single black patrolman. The on-site commander of the NHSP that night was Inspector Lloyd Jones, nicknamed Goon Join Jones by the black community for the mistreatment that he meted out. Jones had joined the Highway Patrol in 1956 and had participated in several of the confrontational moments of the state's civil rights era. He'd been in Jackson to meet the Freedom Riders in 1961. He was among the troopers who had refused to protect James Meredith in 1962 when he attempted to enroll at the University of Mississippi. He'd ordered the tear gassing of one of the protesters' campsites during the 1966 March Against Fear. And in 1967, he had been one of the officers who'd fired his weapon the night civil rights activist Benjamin Brown was killed on Lynch Street, right on the edge of the Jackson State campus. He claimed he'd shot into the air. Jones was, according to one local newspaper man, a legend in his own time, a quote, redneck hero because of his tough treatment of black people. The patrolmen under his charge too included many past and current members of the Klan. Some local activists as a result actually referred to the highway patrol as the segregationist army. The choices the officers made that night were clearly grounded then in their racialized racist view of the students. 
looking at them through a white supremacist lens, the officers accepted stereotypical myths about black criminality and approached the campus that night with an exaggerated sense of danger. The officers' assumptions of danger were demonstrated, for instance, in the arms they carried that night, arms better suited to warfare than crowd control. The highway patrol brought shotguns loaded with double-op buckshot. Asked about why they chose those weapons, Lloyd Jones responded that it was because they look mean. He explained further, it's just to show them that we do have the firepower if they keep rioting, keep destroying public property, or trying to hurt people. Something will be done about it. The patrolmen were allowed, in fact, to bring their own personal ammunition and weapons as well. Some brought military ammunition, including armor-piercing bullets. The police also brought two 9 millimeter submachine guns to show excessive force. The city police were also armed with shotguns loaded with number one buckshot. Questioned later about the choice of such heavy shot, Chief of Detectives Pierce replied, if you're going to have to shoot, you better mean business. And as I mentioned before, they brought Thompson's tank. When they arrived on campus in turn, the officers continually misjudged the situation, the result of their exaggerated sense that the students were dangerous. The chief of detectives for the police, for instance, suggested that once they started burning the truck, we didn't know when they would start burning buildings. They had no plans to burn buildings. The on-site commander described the students as hysterical. His sergeant concurred, suggesting he saw a very large and unruly crowd and a very dangerous situation. On learning of the second fire at the other edge of campus at Dalton and Lynch, this same sergeant suggested that he had thought, well, okay, they're going to burn the town down. Trained to see the students as a threat, the Jackson police and the highway patrol saw a riot where there simply wasn't one. And maybe, maybe this is why they inexplicably marched to the middle of campus, because this move made no sense at all. As Vernon Steve Weekly described the scene at Alexander Hall, that night was a quiet night. Kids were outside having a good time. Music was blasting. Alexander Hall was, after all, quote, where all the girls are. That's where all the lovers were. That certainly described Murphy Carter, who was standing around talking to his girlfriend. As Larry Breland described it, it was a warm May night near graduation and everybody just chilling out. Even the mayor noted that he did not see any problems down the street at Alexander Hall as he looked there shortly before the firing started. As the police and patrol moved up, he said, I didn't see any big crowd. I didn't see any great activity up toward Alexander Hall or for that matter, anywhere. This decision to march through campus and to stop in front of this dormitory was just one part of a massive failure of protocol that night. A failure again connected to the officers overblown fear of the students and their disregard for the students well-being. Major Wilson, who'd established the Jackson Police Department's riot training program, was out of town. So Lieutenant Warren McGee, his second in command, was placed in charge of the forces of the Jackson Police Department. He did not provide any specific, or he did not receive any specific instructions, excuse me, from his commanders. Instead, they quickly issued riot equipment without monitoring which gun was given to which officer and headed out to the campus without a briefing. The highway patrol also failed to brief their officers. Also unclear was what the relationship was to be between these different arms of law enforcement. The city should have been in command, with the highway patrol only assisting, but without a briefing, leadership was clearly confused about this. In turn, General Johnson of the National Guard assumed that when he and his troops arrived, the other forces would leave and follow their orders, heading to the campus perimeter. And none of that happened. Instead, when the fire in front of Stewart Hall was doused, they marched to the middle of campus where they opened fire on unarmed civilians. They claimed they were endangered by the students, but they were being confronted by rock throwing. But first, the bulk of the evidence suggests there was very little rock throwing happening. In fact, none of the four reporters President Alexander Hall recalled seeing more than a couple of things thrown. Law enforcement's account of a steady barrage of objects simply was unsupported by the physical evidence as well. The next day, the city did not find it necessary to conduct any unusual cleanup on Lynch Street, nor did the college. No policemen or state troopers were hospitalized as a result of any injuries sustained that night either. There simply wasn't great danger. But even if there had been, 
Even if rocks and bricks and bottles were thrown, protocol would not have called for, in fact, would not even have allowed opening fire on the students. This explains the emergence, I think, of the story of the sniper. In the aftermath, many officers, I think, realizing what they'd done, concocted a story that there had been a sniper in the dorm. The evidence, though, is clear that there was not one. Neither Jackson State security officers nor the one campus dean present at the scene reported hearing it. any shooting. The mayor heard no shots prior to the volley either. Even reporter Hank Downey, who thought he might have heard two shots somewhere on campus before the bottle broke, was vehement in saying that he heard no one talk about there being a sniper and had never had that thought cross his mind. Even some members of law enforcement were clear there'd been no gunfire at Alexander Hall. Both Lieutenant McGee of the Jackson Police and General Johnson of the National Guard reported hearing no shots prior to the barrage, and the FBI found no evidence of shooting from inside the dormitory. It's crucial to note once more, though, that even if there had been a sniper, opening fire on the crowd and on the dormitory contradicted established law enforcement protocol for such a circumstance. They simply should not have opened fire, but they did, and they shot for 28 seconds and they left behind 400 distinct bullet and buckshot marks on the walls of Alexander Hall. As the President's Commission on Campus and Rest concluded of this massacre, the 28 second fusillade from the police officers was an unreasonable, unjustified overreaction and was completely unwarranted. This interpretation though, this idea that this was completely unwarranted had to compete with other versions of what had happened on the campus in the aftermath. As students, police, government officials, community members, and reporters told the story of what had happened, three different competing storylines emerged to dominate the conversation. For the Jackson State community, indeed in Black communities across the country, the events at Jackson State simply could not be understood unless they were put in the context of the racial dynamics behind what had taken place. For these observers, the killings were one more chapter in the brutal history of racial violence against African Americans in the United States. In this telling, the shootings were a reckless and intolerable assault, an execution, a wanton murder, a massacre, and clearly the result of racism. The violence hearkened for many back to the white plantation mentality and commentators repeatedly referred to the particular racial history of Mississippi out of which this violence did in fact emerge. They talked about its state-sanctioned racial violence as the context for the tragedy. Some brought up the history of lynching. Others compared what had happened to the Holocaust, describing the highway Mississippi, excuse me, the highway patrol as stormtroopers and Jackson State as our Buchenwald and Dachau. For most in the black community though, the most obvious context for making sense of these senseless shootings was the recent history of violence against African-Americans. Many pointed to the death of, of Benjamin Brown three years earlier. Others looked beyond Jackson and remembered the February 1968 murders uh, of students at South Carolina State College at, Ox at Orangeburg, where students had in fact been protesting segregation. Soon termed the Orangeburg massacre, in this event, law enforcement opened fire and killed two students and injured at least 27 others. Still others drew links to the more recent murder in Chicago of Black Panther readers, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. But especially present for many were the events just four days earlier in Augusta, Georgia, where in the midst of a civil disturbance, police had killed six black men, all of them unarmed and all of them shot in the back. For the students of Jackson State and many of their supporters, what had happened to them was not an isolated incident was part of a long history of state sanctioned violence against African Americans and another example of the recent escalation of that violence. And this is in fact exactly the interpretation that I as an historian have, have reached as well. This was very much a part of the long arc of state violence against black people in the United States and in particular in Mississippi. And it was this narrative of course that the students at Jackson State had sought to protect in its immediate aftermath. Others, still sympathetic to students, told the story a little bit differently and saw it as one part of an upsurge in campus activism and campus conflict. In this narrative, the students were again um, unwilling victims of the uncontrolled use of state firepower, but race simply wasn't part of the story for these observers. Instead, they focused only on the fact that these were students 
and described the violence as an injury to the academic community rather than to the black community. For these narrators, the shootings were still an example of law enforcement turned lawless and the president and his vice president Spiro Agnew drew criticism for their feverish law and order rhetoric and their tendency to demonize protesters. In such a story, of course, the linkages to the shootings at Kent State 10 days earlier loomed large. Indeed, the connection was common enough for Newsweek to note how quickly such comparisons were made. The Indiana University School newspaper made clear how completely the two could be completed by simply crossing out Kent State and replacing it with Jackson in the headline of their story about what took place. A subheading in Time Magazine offered a similarly striking example when it identified the shootings at Jackson State simply as Kent State too. This way of describing the shootings, focusing in only on the students as students, facilitated the nation's quick forgetting as it was lost behind the story of Kent State. But far more dangerous in terms of the pursuit of justice in the aftermath was a third way of interpreting the events, this law and order narrative that the police had used and which was picked up by so many others. And in this narrative, the victims and aggressors are simply flipped. Blame is reassigned and the meaning of the shootings is reinterpreted. Such a narrative was already very well integrated into American public conversations. In the election of 1968, Richard Nixon had used law and order as one part of his Southern strategy, that political tactic he used to lure the white South into the Republican party. While generally avoiding explicit or direct mention of race, Law and order rhetoric at this time appealed very purposefully to white racial fears, unease that had been enhanced as much by civil rights gains as by other things happening in the country. Two speeches given in the wake of the shootings by the governor of Mississippi, John Bell Williams, illustrate the central theme of this narrative, this narrative that takes what actually took place and flips it on its head. On May 21st, Williams took to the airways to defend himself, his state, and the law enforcement officers. And in his version of the events, the city police and the state highway patrol were made up of well-trained, highly experienced and competent professionals, professionals who had only responded because they were endangered by, quote, sniper activity and numerous barrages of missiles. And so he suggested they had acted in self-defense. We can take comfort and thank God, he maintained, that the casualties were so limited. For him, the death of the students was the culmination of two nights of serious and violent civil disorder, and he declared that Mississippi was going to be ruled by law and not by mob violence. He followed up this first speech with a second one where he reiterated these themes and suggested that what happened at Jackson State was part and parcel of a well-planned and carefully executed revolution against our American institutions. All of these protests, he suggested, had one common denominator, disrespect of law and contempt for all duly constituted authority and total disregard of the rights and property of others. In such a circumstance, he said, it was his job to restore order. In his words, we can hear the reframing of victimhood. It's important to note that in this depiction of the events, the race of the students went unnamed, even as the governor clearly criminalized them in his depiction. It was a classic law and order move. Many other local and state politicians, as well as much of the local, regional, um, and even national media, as well as the white citizenry of Jackson, readily agreed with this perspective and castigated the students, blaming them for the violence that occurred. The real blame, the Meridian Star suggested, lies with the minority of student hoodlums who break the law at will. The deaths at Jackson State, instead of being the horrific murders that they were, were re-described as the inevitable result of disregard for law and order. As we look at the actions in the aftermath, we can see these different interpretations competing with one another for control of events. Many protesters, for instance, acted from the perspective of the students at Jackson State, acted on their racial understanding of what had taken place. So for instance, on Monday, May 18th, black students at Jackson High Schools boycotted classes and organized a march to the governor's mansion. Many in the local black community shared the students' outrage and some of the adults called for a boycott of white stores to draw attention to the violence. And they backed up their demands for justice with meaningful pressure 
James Green's funeral one week after the shootings became a moment not only for grief, but also for calls to act. Across the country, many college campuses like the Claremont Colleges in California held memorial services for Green and Gibbs and for quote, all the black brothers who have been killed for resisting cultural, political, economic and physical genocide. Others adopted resolutions or flew flags at half mast. A five day march against repression in Georgia protested the killings at Kent State, Jackson State and in Augusta. And you can see the names on the placard that the man carries that says they did not die in vain. You can see Philip Gibbs and James Green's names right at the top of his placard. In the black community in particular, the racial narrative was not only spoken, but acted upon. But as the legal system took up events at Jackson State, it would be the law and order perspective that controlled events and outcomes. There were moments when it appeared the government officials at the local and federal levels would seek both to understand the violence at Jackson State and to pursue appropriate legal outcomes. For instance, when the Mississippi Highway Patrol refused to cooperate with the FBI, the Justice Department actually initiated a special federal grand jury to investigate the shooting. A closer look though reveals the emptiness of this action. Appointed to reside over the case was Judge William H. H. Cox a man well known, unfortunately, for his earlier rulings and their racist underpinnings. As he impaneled the jury on June 29th, he framed the work of the grand jury with law and order rhetoric. He blamed anarchists and revolutionaries for the events on campus and suggested, this district will not provide safe sanctuary for militants or for anarchists or for revolutionaries of any race. He demonized the students as a mob, and the federal grand jury returned no indictments. In fact, they didn't even release a full report. Concurrent with the federal grand jury, the Hines County grand jury also convened for an investigation of violence at Jackson State. In charging the jury, Judge Russell D. Moore borrowed from Judge Cox's instructions. And after a three week investigation, they too returned no indictments against law enforcement. In fact, they returned only one indictment against an African-American man from the local community. He was charged with arson and inciting a riot, charges that were eventually dropped for lack of evidence. The grand jury's report made clear how they understood what had happened at Jackson State. He said, they said, excuse me, we find that under the riot situation then existing, the officers of the Jackson police and the highway patrol had a right and were justified in discharging their weapons. When people said, as the students and outsiders did at Jackson State College take the law into their own hands and engage in civil disorders and riots, they must expect to be injured or killed when law enforcement officers are required to reestablish order. Such a perspective was expressed one more horrific time and with great force. In 1972, the families of Phil Lafayette Gibbs and James Earl Green as well as three of the injured students sued the state of Mississippi, the governor, the mayor, and almost 50 law enforcement officers. And one more time, this trial, unfortunately, offered the opportunity for advocates of the law and order perspective to criminalize the victims and to recast the police as somehow having acted to defend local communities. Defense lawyers described the law enforcement officers as finely trained policemen and reminded the all white jury that the average man was a family man like you, educated, that they were people who have dedicated themselves to preserving and protecting life, not taking it. The students, in contrast, were depicted as criminals. Most obvious was their portrayal as members of a riotous mob. The defense repeatedly asked the students to recount what had taken place, what kind of property damage they had seen, and whether or not they had attempted to halt any property destruction. And they framed these questions to emphasize the race of the students. Even the two victims who had died that night were described as being part of the mob. Leroy Kenter, who was shot in the upper thigh, faced surgery to repair his femur, was hospitalized for 39 days, but in the courtroom was asked questions like whether his real name was Kenter and whether he didn't go by an alias sometimes. Particular attention was paid to the students' purported verbal assault of the officers. Remember, the accusation is that they had been, in, that the officers had been in tremendous physical danger. 
in the courthouse, there was a lot of attention paid to the language that they used purportedly when they yelled at the officers. They talked about young people who seemed to have been transgressing, in fact, racial boundaries with their taunts. The lawyers repeatedly mentioned that the police were subjected not only to a barrage of brick throwing, but every known type of filthy, disgusting epithet. The students were cursing, they said, and using all kinds of vile language. During cross-examinations, defense lawyers asked the students to name the absentees, to say them out loud in the courtroom, obviously to uh, infuse uh, a sense of racial anger among the all-white jury. Here, the students were criminalized not for posing any kind of physical risk, but for breaching racial etiquette. There was little surprise in the Black community when the jury found the defendants innocent of any liability for the injuries or the deaths. Law and order, or I should say, actually, the law and order narrative carried the day. Justice and the law did not. Remarkably, as I've worked on this project, there have been those who believe that we should leave these events of the past in the past. I can't agree. As the great James Baldwin wrote, to accept one's past, one's history, is not the same thing as drowning in it, is learning how to use it. An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life like clay in a season of drought. And so we need our real history because it can teach us things. It can guide us. So what does this story, this history of the murder and injury of black students at Jackson State 50 years ago have to teach us now? Well, first, I think studying this assault offers us a view into the period of the late 1960s and early 1970s and allows us to see in particular the new employment of a language, of a rhetoric of law and order to justify ongoing violence against people of color. In the wake of the gains made by the civil rights movement and the black power movement, new narratives were needed to justify the continuing use of violence by the state and the perception of an inequitable system of criminal justice. The rhetoric of law and order with its ability to criminalize people of color while denying the role of race in its policies filled this role perfectly, as I'm afraid I've demonstrated. In turn, the shooting reminds us that the crisis of state violence against African Americans isn't new in 2020, nor is the attempt to justify it with the language of law and order. As we reel right now from the continued news of police shootings of people of color, we must recognize that though the heightened press attention and the growing concern of white Americans may be new, this year's shootings sit alongside those of Jackson State in May 1970 and are part of a much longer arc of state violence against black people that began in slavery and has continued unabated for centuries. What's deeply troubling is that in 2020, the rhetoric of law and order with its history and its underpinnings of racism has returned with stunning force and is being voiced by people across the nation, including political leaders. I hope that my exploration of this mindset, which facilitated the shootings at Jackson State and the miscarriage of justice in their aftermath, can help us recognize how fully this rhetoric of law and order is infused with white supremacy, how fully it is coded with race, and how easily it can be employed to justify what is the unjustifiable violence against people of color. I began today by suggesting that this talk was one of historical reclamation, an effort to fight back against historical amnesia. Telling sto the story of the students at Jackson State College reminds us that we cannot must not treat each of these deaths as an isolated incident, but must instead acknowledge the long history of state sanctioned violence. And so finally, I also believe that one of the reasons to know this story of what happened at Jackson State is so that we can continue to tell the story of these people and to say their names. It's hard to face the past that I've been discussing today, but how much harder must it be to live with the loss of a loved one that so many people did and do in the wake of the shootings at Jackson State College. And so we owe it to those who loved Philip Lafayette Gibbs and James Earl Green to remember them. And so also must we remember Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown, Eric Garner and Renisha McBride, John Crawford, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland, Philando Castile, Ahmed Bra Arbery, Breonna Taylor, 
George Floyd and Atatiana Jefferson. And again, Philip Lafayette Gibbs and James Earl Green. Only by remembering them can we finally stop the parade of horrific assaults that continue to trouble our nation. Thank you for joining me in this effort today, this effort to say their names and to tell their stories. Thank you. And we're back. Thank you, that was a great presentation. We have questions. Can you hear us? All right. Uh, were changes made to the Jackson State campus to address the violent interactions between the city's residents and the students? Yes, there were. They took two different forms. Um, one was that finally the uh, um, Lynch Street thoroughfare uh, was closed off at either end of the campus, which is something that the campus, the students had desired for years and years, that President Peoples had asked for many, many times. Finally, in the wake of the shooting, this was done. What was kind of hurtful about it in its, in its initial um, closure is that it was, the, the way it was closed was with six foot high or eight foot high chain link fences. So that in fact, the students gained what they had asked for, but it was presented in a way that students referred to as making it feel like they lived um, in a prison, that it was better suited to Parchman than it was to a college campus. Now, fortunately, the campus took charge of that space and have, has made it um, a beautiful uh, pedestrian walkway that commemorates um, Philip Gibbs and James Green um, appropriately so. Uh, and that was something that President Peoples worked very hard to make happen. The other thing that happened that was kind of interesting is that in, in, a, in a move that was not unlike that on college campuses across the country, the student handbook, um, um, actually this happened before the shooting, so I, I suppose it's not fair to, to raise, but the student handbook even prior to the spring of 1970 had put in a new rules about student protest uh, and new um, punishments basically for acting um, on one's political beliefs so that the kinds of things that took place uh, in the spring of 1970 on campuses around the country uh, were uh, written into student handbooks suggesting that you get in a lot of trouble uh, if you did those kinds of things. Sarah Campbell asks, how unprecedented was the decision by Jackson State students to guard the evidence? And how important was that particular step in this new work to correct the narrative? Hmm. Um, I missed the first part of your question. Could you say it again? How unprecedented was the decision oh, by Jackson right. State students to guard the evidence? Right. Yeah, very much unprecedented. It was a bold move and a very courageous move. Uh, in the aftermath of this, you know, wanton um, explosion of gunfire, they chose to stand out front beginning that very first evening uh, when they refused to return inside the dorms, though they had been asked to do so by the president. Students said no. We are not going back inside. You're telling us it'll be safer. Well, it wasn't safe to be in there, so we're staying out here. And they stayed there for 10 days um, to protect that evidence. Um, even as there were court orders requiring them to move, they simply did not do so. Uh, and this was really important, I think, in terms of making possible uh, the FBI report that makes clear just how many gunshots there had been, just how many rounds had been fired because neither the Highway uh, and Safety Patrol nor the Jackson Police um, was fully cooperative in terms of sharing the um, realities of what had taken place. Um, they were, especially the Highway Patrol, very recalcitrant uh, in sharing information. But the FBI had that evidence from the building that allowed, I think, um, very clear information on just how horrific those 28 seconds had been. So I think it was both unprecedented and very, very important, and I would add the word courageous. What were reactions to the Jackson State shootings in other Mississippi towns by both black and white people? Yeah, yeah there was a lot of reaction all over the state, as you can imagine. Uh, this was uh, a, a, a a, a, each, a, this was an event of international significance, and folks in Mississippi understood that. 
And so I, uh, on the, the white community, and again, I don't want, I'll speak as if these are, are blocks, and it's simply not true. Of course, there were white Mississippians who were um, closely allied with the students at Jackson State and with the Jackson State campus. But the vast majority um, of press outlets really pilloried the students in the aftermath uh, and really said some horrific things uh, about what had taken place. There was even one letter to the editor. This was actually in a, in, a, in a New Orleans paper, but actually congratulated law enforcement for what it had done. So there was really awful um, responses in many um, white media outlets and among many uh, white Mississippians around the state, um, suggesting um, the power of this viewpoint expressed, as I said, so um, vividly by Governor uh, John Bell Williams. In the black communities across the state, there was a great deal of, of outrage uh, and people descended on Jackson State from all over the state, indeed from all over the nation uh, to stand alongside those students. So as they stood in front of that dormitory protecting evidence, they would have visits from uh, a US Senator from Massachusetts, the lone um, black Senator in the Senate um, from Massachusetts. He came down to Mississippi to stand alongside those students. Uh, and so also did civil rights activists from around the state. So there was a great deal of support for the students on the one hand um, in the black community and then and really a, a rejection of, of this as a tragedy um, by many in the white community. Yeah. Diane Williams asks if you know how long after the Jackson State shootings uh, until the bombing of Rabbi Perry Nussbaum's house. Do you know how long after the shootings? I don't. It's a great question, and I'm sorry, I don't have the answer to that. Um, did any of the police officers, highway patrol, or National Guard officers who were involved that night ever produce any firsthand accounts, any written pieces or oral histories? Nope. That's one of the <laughs> things that was so interesting, right? that I looked and looked for press coverage because though there wasn't as much press coverage on the anniversaries as I would argue there should have been, there was coverage um, and there would be stories told. And there were many people from the Jackson State community and many of you will know those folks. Some of you may even be those folks who have told this story again and again and again to anyone who would listen. Uh, James Lapp Baker pops to mind, Vernon Steve Weekly. Um, Constance Slaughter Harvey. There are several people who have told this story and told it eloquently, um, but it is all from the Jackson State um, students and community. Um, I think I found one article in which uh, two members of law enforcement were quoted, um, two white members of law enforcement, and they basically took the line that um, that was a long time ago and there's no reason to bring it up and what we did was right. Um, I was not able to locate any white officers to interview for my book, though I did have the opportunity to interview one black officer uh, who believed that, in fact, this had been planned. You mentioned the FBI um, case against the Mississippi Highway Patrol. Are those files open to the public? Yes, they are. Um, they're difficult to access um, because they're not digitized, but they can be accessed right there at MDAH, in fact. They have a, a um, you have a microfilm copy of it right there in your reading room. Um, I spent hours and hours and hours and hours um, making Xeroxes off of that microfilm to bring <laughs> home with me and had such great help from the staff there. And I can assure anyone who's interested then in viewing those files um, that that is one way to do it. A second way is, of course, through the Jackson State University archives, where the archivist Darlita Ballard, again, was so much help to me. And there you can see some of the hard copies of the Gibbs Green collection that the Jackson State Archives holds, um, which includes not only the FBI records, but a number of Jackson State specific archival materials um, that are really remarkable. As I say, that was through a federal grant, um, I believe, um, was uh, made into a microfilm that you can view at MDAH. Um, and it's, it's readily accessible on, you have to sit an old microfilm reel, but you know, that's what historians do. But again, I really encourage people who are interested in following up that the records are amazing and readily available. There are also some additional records at the National Archives that are not available in Mississippi. Um, but frankly, for, for what most people would want to have access to, I think what's on that microfilm uh, at MDAH and in the archives at, at Jackson State University uh, is extraordinary.
You mentioned Constance Slaughter Harvey. Could you say a few words about her role both in the event and then in helping you with the book? I can. Um, if you don't know um, uh, Ms. Slaughter Harvey, uh, I can just say that you, you should go and read up on her. She is one of Mississippi's, indeed one of the United States' great heroes of this era. Uh, as a civil rights lawyer, the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Mississippi. She uh, had sisters going to Jackson State and she also lived relatively close by and heard the gunfire that night, uh, was not permitted onto the campus that night. They would not allow her to enter, uh, but she did gain access the next day where she immediately began speaking with the students and they uh, took her on as their lawyer. Uh, and she developed this legal case uh, from its beginnings. Um, unfortunately, both fortunately and unfortunately, eventually a New York law firm would join the case. And in what was, a, I would argue, a catastrophic development, um, one of the partners of that law firm demanded the opportunity to make opening arguments in that civil trial, and he bungled it. Um, and I feel very strongly that had, had uh, Constance Slaughter Harvey been allowed to make those opening statements and to have played the role in the trial that she deserved to play, um, I don't know that the initial outcome would have been any different, but I think the long-term outcome might have been. So again, she was a hero from the beginning, not only for this, but for her ongoing community work in the state of Mississippi, which she continues to this day. And I have nothing but the deepest respect and gratitude um, for her willingness to have spoken with me about my project. I have a question. Uh, this event took place at the end of the first semester of forcibly integrated public school classes in Mississippi. Did it have any effect on whites leaving the public school system? Oh, this, the shooting specifically I can't speak to, but I think raising that issue of the integration of public schools is really important context for making sense of this. Because again, you can imagine um, how raw the emotions were um, for a lot of people living in Mississippi at that time. Uh, and so the spring of 1970 is a particularly overwrought time I'm not suggesting that that justifies anything. I am saying that it helps us understand or make sense of what seems just completely senseless, but that you had a white community, uh, many members of which were up in arms, a uh, feeling that they were in fact being victimized. Now we all understand, of course, that that's not the case. But again, the notion is that people were feeling that way, which I think helped to infuse the kind of racial anger that clearly sat behind these shootings. I mean, these shootings were about um, white officers being mad as the Dickens uh, and knowing that nothing would happen to them if they opened fire. I think that's the underpinning uh, of what happened there. That's what made this tragedy possible, this massacre possible. We have come almost to the top of the hour. We have time for one last bit. But I wonder if, if you have any thoughts on uh, or, or remarks about the delayed graduation for that class of 1970. Oh. Thank you for raising that because that gives me an opportunity um, to give a shout out to the class of 1970 and also to share um, the story to make sure people know this. One more piece of what is so tragic here is that of course that class didn't get to walk across the stage in 1970. They were sent home. Uh, the semester came to an end. And many people in the Jackson State community have been working very, very hard, including a number of people from the class of 70 and the surrounding classes, to plan for a graduation in the spring of 2020, which again, had to be canceled. This was going to be a very special moment with honorary degrees being given, with members of the class receiving their diplomas on at the graduation. Right. And of course, that too had to be postponed. I believe there is still hope that this can happen. Um, we're just waiting for COVID to get out of the way. But again, um, my gratitude to those who keep this story alive locally and who do the good work um, of the Jackson State community to keep this story alive. Uh, and there are several people, so I won't name any at the fear of, of leaving someone out, uh, but a number of people have worked very hard on a committee um, for many, 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 many months to make these things happen. And it was really a tragedy that this had to be postponed a second time. But yes. this will come. It will come. Our, gradu uh, our graduation, our gratitude to everyone involved and particularly to Nancy Bristow for the production of her new book, Steeped in the Blood of Racism, 
Black Power, Law and Order, and the 1970 shootings at Jackson State College. We'll have signed copies of this available through the Mississippi Museum store. There's contact information in the um, comments for this live stream for how you can buy your copy of that. Uh, I hope that you will all tune in again next week for Mike Bunn's History's Lunch on um, the early history of the state during the American Revolution. But for now, thank you so much, Nancy, for this program today, and we look forward to more from you in the future. Thanks so much.